welcome everyone to uh, another panel in our virtual SPX here in 2020. Um, and befitting um, an election year in a year where anyone who said that, uh, oh, politics just don't interest me, has really been put to the test since uh, everyone has to deal with politics and the political uh, whether they like it or not, given the state of the country and the world right now. Um, let's turn to experts in this, uh, people who do various forms of political cartooning uh, and, and or writing and cartooning about uh, government politics. This panel is called Strategies of Resistance. Uh, we're going to explore how people choose to personalize their strategies um, how and why they choose to write about powerful state and corporate structures. Um, and this will be regarding visual strategies, how they use satire and other decisions that go into um, making this as much of a personal thing as a political act. Uh, on this panel, we have um, Mr. Fish, Dwayne Booth, and uh, he is a cartoonist who has uh, several recent books, um, most notably, And Then the World Blew Up and Nobody Left from Fanagraphics. Um, and he's also doing a book with uh, Ralph Nader, uh, also from Fanagraphics. What is, what's the title of that one? It's uh, the, um, How the Rats Vetoed Congress. Gotcha. We have um, uh, Brina Nunez. Uh, who most notably has published a lot of work with uh, The Nib, but also The New Yorker and anthologies like Tales from La Vida, a Latinx comics anthology, the uh, Eisner winning anthology Drawing Power, and the, the Ignatz nominated Be Gay Do Comics anthology. And uh, her story from The Nib, I Exist, was nominated for an Ignatz Award and that ceremony uh, will be, uh, well, by now, you'll have already known who won. But wow. through the magic of time, we don't quite know yet. But congratulations on those various nominations and or wins. Thank you. You're welcome. We have uh, R. Sikoriak, um, the celebrated genius style mimic uh, who's delving into historical and uh, technical documents to create unusual visual styles going with them is kind of uh, kind of carved out this uh, unique niche in comics. Uh, his most recent uh, attempt at this is uh, Constitution Comics, or Const Constitution Illustrated rather, um, where each he basically publishes the entire Constitution and um, each page is a different drawing inspired from a different style which usually he cleverly uh, matches up style with section. Um, and then we have finally uh, Durf, uh, who has uh, most recently best known for his graphic novel, uh, My Friend Dahmer, which was also turned into an excellent feature film. Um, but he had years under his belt doing um, political comics, observational comics, um, and in particular, his, um, his observations of sort of the seedier side of urban life <laughs> and his grotesque style were quite notable. But um, he, he also did the graphic novel Trashed, inspired by his career in a garbage truck. Um, but most recently, um, his a book about to be released or released this week, if I'm not mistaken. Released yesterday. Yes, congratulations. Is um, there it is. is Kent State and what is the full full title? Kent State for Kent State for Dead in Ohio. Right. Um, and this is I I really thought of you in particular for this panel, and for and work in general. And I'll go ahead and start with you. Is um. So of course, the Kent State shootings were done by, if I'm not mistaken, um, National Guard Correct. on uh, complete innocent bystanders at a protest 
uh, over 40 years ago, 50, 50 years, years ago. ago. Uh, May 4, 1970. Yeah. Uh, protesting Richard Nixon in the Vietnam War. Correct. Uh, and in many ways, it was a galvanizing event. And uh, I guess the first question is, in writing it, what, in, what inspired you to want to write this, other than being sort of an Ohio native and kind of growing up with this as part of your cultural memory? Well, that um, was mainly it, yeah. I mean, and it's just a great story. And I thought um, a lot of people didn't know it and that it would be incredibly relevant coming into 2020. I, I didn't realize just how relevant it would be. But, um, uh, you know, that it would serve as, as, as a bit of a warning to, to people who were rising up and taking to the streets that when you really, truly threaten those in power, their, their response can be lethal and probably will be lethal. That's not to say you shouldn't take to the streets, but it's just good information to have. And, uh, you know, I, um, the bottom line, it was just a great story. And, and I really wanted to tell it because I've been carrying it with me for so long. Um, as you've, as it's being published now, um, what kind of parallels in that story, uh, have you seen played out in exactly the same way over the last few months, um, given the protests over, um, police executions, basically? Sure. Just, I mean, the similarities are positively chilling. I mean, they're, you just swap in you know, the BLM uh, protests for anti-war protests, and it's the same equation. You know, an authoritarian strongman who doesn't really follow the Constitution, paranoia, political rancor, the whole, the whole thing. And, I, I, you know, my fear is that we're just barreling toward another Kent State. I think it's kind of a miracle that we haven't had one so far. Um. Rina, with regard to your strategies, um, your work is ex is both very personal and uh, simultaneously very political. Um, when you are talking about a particular topic, um, what goes into doing it in terms of both balancing research and journalism with personal experience, anecdotes, and how you and your own cultural experience? Yeah, I feel like um, when it comes to specifically focusing on um, like anything related to afro Salvan diaspora and experiences, um, I, I don't know, I sometimes feel like I'm relatively new to um, journalism myself, but I firmly believe that the personal um, becomes very political and my body definitely in this state i.e empire that we're living in <laughs> is heavily politicized and it still continues to to be um, existing in such a way of crossing uh, various borders so i i feel like when it comes to the the piece i i made for the the nib um i exist it just comes from a place where um I, I just personally wanted to talk about what it's kind of like to have these nuances of existing as an Afro-descended person from Central American parents, um, but also capturing like some of the complexities that come with that because um, um, El Salvador as a country firmly believes for a very long time that um, racism doesn't exist. There's no such thing as anti-Blackness either or that racism only exists in the United States. And even though, it, yeah, those, that's a really true thing. It's something that is really, um, it's a conversation that is firmly, firmly tucked away under the veil of, um, of white supremacy um, in this part of Latin America and so many other parts. So I feel like it's a lot of it is based off of just personal conversations I, I want to talk about and so many other Afro Salvadoran people or people who are coming to um, their own identity and recognizing that 
they are also Afro-descended peoples. Um, it's just kind of like this um, communal or collective um, push that we need to have more representation around our stories. And the research just came from actually a zine that I made years ago um, around um, 2015, I believe. And I just tried to do a little bit of research on Afro-Salvadoran Afro identity, which was not really um, accessible at the time, but now more scholarship has been rising and I'm really, really thankful for that. But it's taken a long time to come across sources, but um, with the little sources that I've had, I've been able to recycle a lot of that from my zine um, and use that in um, the piece. That's interesting. And um, I'm, I'm of Chilean descent and I'm well aware of like in uh, my mother's country, the extreme tension between basically the people who are the descendants of colonizers and the indigenous peoples um, and how, again, it's not spoken of or thought of as like, oh, we're racist. It's just that it's so deeply ingrained that the descendants, uh, I'm, I'm directly descended from Francisco Pizarro, the conquistador who, you know, destroyed the Aztec empire, which is kind of a, a horrible legacy, but it's one that like, it seems like each, each uh, diaspora has to like, really be aware of the truth of um, their background before any kind of progress can be made. Is that something you found that in sort of investigating sort of you being on one side and talking about people, it's like, oh, there's no such thing as racism in our country. Yeah, um, for me personally, um, I also grapple with like the complexities of existing as somebody who's like Latinx, who also has like most likely colonizer ancestry as well, um, more so from uh, my mother's side. But um, yeah, I think for for us as Salvadorans specifically, like we. Um, I think collectively we've always had like this curiosity just kind of floating over our heads and we are always racialized as black. Um, even though we were always told uh, from like, um, from generations, um, older generations that, you know, we're just homogeneously like, you know, mestizo, mestiza, like, or Latino, depending where you are in Latin America those monikers sound really different but homogeneously like brown or you know you want to really center your your spanish heritage as well um that's more so some of like a a common thing i've been hearing from other salvadorans who are from um the motherland but um yeah i i believe that collectively as um as a community um here in the states and over there we've been trying to like pursue this process of reclaiming like Afro descendancy for a while. And with that comes with trying to self educate ourselves. And what does that mean? Where do certain, some words in Spanish, where are they derived of? And we use a lot of um, Africanisms in Spanish, um, you know, throughout all of Latin America. And um, I feel like we're still trying to pursue like what that means to us, but we want to get as much evidence as we can in order to have El Salvador officially recognize itself as a multi-ethnic country rather than just, again, a homogeneously like mestizo state. I hope that answers the question. That, yeah, that makes, that's great. That makes complete sense. Um, Bob, so it's interesting, you know, Durf pointed out his book is kind of like a dark reminder of um, a time when there was a president who didn't care about the constitution. And obviously in our state today, we have a government that's trampling over the constitution every single day. Uh, what inspired you to um, basically write a book that was celebrating the rule of law, such as it was written? Um, and not only that, but uh, the constitution, you know, while it talks a lot about rights, 
also kind of refers to sort of darker periods, a, in, in a darker period in our country with regard to like, um, in the very beginning, Constitution talked a lot about property, slavery, things like that. Right, and I mean, it's so complicated. Um, I, and that, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Uh, first of all, the word slavery is not mentioned in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. They talk about other persons. I mean, the degree of, of, of burying the lead uh, in the Constitution is, is astonishing. And um, to sort of grapple with all of that while still trying to make the book that I made was, was like, that's a whole other issue. Um, so obviously, uh, you can imagine why I was interested in making this book right now. Um, I'd made a book about Trump about three years ago, and I didn't want to mention him again, but I wanted to talk about what was happening right now. What's, of course, fascinating about the Constitution is eight years ago, people were saying that president was trampling the Constitution. So there are so many ways of interpreting these words. Um, there's so many ways of grappling with the words. In some ways, it was maybe a better project for me than I realized because generally my strategy in making books is to let the words speak for themselves, but let the images add commentary. So what I tried to do in this book, I, I, I guess what I did in this book, was every page is drawn in the style of a different American character or American cartoonist. So you kind of see the words reflected through these different viewpoints, these different visuals. There's, uh, there's, um, cartoonists represented in there who I do not agree with. <laughs> there are many cartoonists I agree with, but I kind of wanted to represent the tapestry of America, which obviously is also something that's under attack right now. So in that way, maybe it speaks more to the moment because I tried to really represent all of America. And we had a president a while ago who spoke about not being the blue America and the red America, but the United States together. So I guess I was trying to represent sort of that idea of the Constitution. But all the words are the Constitution words. So there's lots to there's lots to unpack or get queasy about as you um, as you read it. Um, so Fish, uh, talk about the approaches in your your recent work. In fact, you've 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 done a lot recently. Um, you know, in, uh, in addition to those, you did um, a, a book about turning famous books into cartoons. Um, I'm interested in kind of your approach and then the, the themes of uh, the more political books that you've done with Fantagraphics. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, generally, the approach is um, I, I tend to see the work that all of us do on this panel as um, it, it's really its own unique language. Um, and I, I find that, I feel like it's my job to help preserve and promote how the visual language can, can uh, deepen conversations and, and make them smarter. Um, and so that's just, a, that's just an aside. I, I just find it very, very important to just see this as, as a language that a lot of people are illiterate to. Um, most of the visual language that people are used to is marketing. Um, and that's not what any of us does I would say I think that we're we, we try to go deeper and we we don't want to inspire people to react to images and be uncomfortable and be told that the way to relieve that discomfort is through purchase um, and I feel like that this language has been hijacked in the last few years um, and so yeah so I feel like that that is my job the political side of it you know when you to begin the conversation and ask what we what we how we interact with politics and the politics of now. I tend not even to think about them as politics. I see it as, as this grotesque sort of tribalism. I see it as burlesque. I see it, I, I think to, to call it um, political is, uh, is a, a kind of misdirection that sort of muddies the argument. Because particularly if we're talking about how we engage in this, how we're supposed to engage in this country, which is supposed to be we the people, uh, yet we are just where you can feel it in the air. People are so frustrated. The only time they get the opportunity to feel like they're exercising their, their political voice is by voting. It's bullshit. I mean, I think that, it's, it, that that's problematic because democracy is supposed, to be, is supposed to be happening all the time. 
And I would even argue if it were happening all the time, we wouldn't have the, the two candidates that we have as our only choices right now. So my great frustration with the work that I do is just trying to, to, um, to prove to people, to pull them out of this back and forth of sort of like a, a, a debate between people who are, are rah, rah, rahing their favorite sports team, getting angry at the other side for having a different uniform. Sure, there's substantive differences between both parties, but I think that the, the conversation has been framed by the people in power to the point that you can't be smart in this conversation anymore. I mean, just to speak to what Durf is, is, is done with the Kent State project, um, what was the subtitle of that? Is it Four Dead in Ohio? Four Dead in Ohio. Yeah, so that references um, Neil Young. And, th and this comes from a time when my other book, the, the most recent one, which is called Nobody Left, is an attempt to figure out if progressivism e even exists anymore in this country. And I, and I interview some people who were direct participants or people who um, were eyewitnesses to the 1960s and early 70s um, when the arts community was allowed into this conversation in a different sort of way. Um, and I don't think it is anymore. And I think we as artists, uh, as I said at the beginning of my yammering on and on, is that I think it's our job to, to uh, keep these, these conversations um, smart and honest. And I think that that's what I, the, the, the work that everybody produces on this panel, I think that that is probably your intent. I, I would certainly imagine so. And um, in many ways, political cartooning as such uh, you know, in its current form or the traditional form, like in a newspaper and political cartoons, it's kind of dying because newspapers are dying. Dying, dead, dead <laughs> man. <laughs> Stone dead. <laughs> um, and yet what I'm seeing in the last five, six years is that while that may be true, political cartooning itself is actually um, quite lively. And... Um, and, uh, and Brie in particular represents kind of a younger generation uh, of people who, for the, you know, these are, these are stakes that are everyday stakes, uh, and it's important to write about them. Uh, and it's not just an artistic expression, but like I said, in this, you know, the top of the thing, it's, it's, it's resistance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of interested in everyone's tools with regard to how they're, doing resistance and how like their visual strategies and narrative strategies. And let's go back to, let's go back to Durf. Um, your, your style when you were doing um, the city and other stuff was frequently deliberately grotesque. Um, Post-punk expressionism, I called it. Yeah. Right. Talk about your shift between that style and, and what um, I'm doing now. Yeah. And which is, there's still, there's still vestiges in it and you could see it in your other work. Um, but there's been an evolution. Yeah, hopefully a good evolution. Um, you you got to understand the, what the purpose of, and, you know, Fish can probably agree with this, but when you're working for those free weeklies that I used to work for when I did this stuff, um, you know, it's a casual relationship that the reader has with the content because everybody's just picking it up. It's a free paper. So somebody walks into a coffee shop or they walk into a cafe and they just grab a copy and they flip through it um, at lunch. I mean, back in the 90s anyways, they did this. And uh, so the purpose of the style and why all the weekly paper, the weekly strips were so distinctive and heavily drawn and really kind of visually uh, powerful is because when somebody's flipping through a paper, you want them to catch their attention. And, you know, make them stop and say, oh, maybe I'll read this. I mean, that was the point of those types of, uh, of drawing style. So, you know, we kind of went bonkers with that stuff. When I started doing longer stories and, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably the only, no, I am the only one on the panel here. There, I mean, I really don't do political work anymore. I did it for years, but I kind of burn out on it, frankly. I fought the good fight and, you know, I kind of hung it up. Um, so when I moved on to books, it was it was a whole different ball game. And then the 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 art is there to service the story, and it's all about the story. So then the art has to become a lot more nuanced. It has to become um, a lot more supple. 
and maybe I've, I've worked to make it more natural and less uh, excessive. You know, I'm not indulging. I'm not as indulgent as I used to be. And uh, I like the way I'm drawing now. So it's, uh, and I haven't always liked the way I've drawn at different periods. So I, I'm pretty happy with it. But it's really, it, 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 the, for me, it's all about the story. Which I would argue, can I just say, can I just interject? Because it just made me think of something. I would argue that that is, it, that to me is the best form of political criticism you can produce. Because the way you describe it, you're, you're communicating a <coughs> human experience. Right. Right. And, and to me, that is, that's as deep as you should get as a political communicator. Because what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're demonstrating that human beings are vulnerable and they're worth protection. Right. And what I write now is very personal stories rather than, you know, riffs about issues or politics or even politicians. I just don't, that's not what I do anymore. I suppose, you know, I'll never entirely get away from politics and something. And all of my books have had some element of that, but they're not, you know, they're not political cartoons like you do or, you know, like uh, well, I hope others I'm do here. here. Trust me. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm in awe of, of people that can keep keep going with, with straight political cartoons because it is important work and we're seeing less and less of it. And, you know, the people on this panel do it as well as anyone. And I, I mean, I just reached a point where I couldn't do it anymore. I mean, I just, you know, it was like a baseball player. I just lost it and uh, I had to move on. But I still love the, the, the art form a lot and, and still look at this stuff. Well, and I would certainly say that just because you're not doing this uh, directly politically didactic work doesn't mean that your work isn't political as you... Well, no, I, I agree. Um, you know, trash in particular is a lot about um, class issues. Mm -hmm. And then obviously uh, Kent State, you know, certainly a, a great story, but unconsciously or not... Um, has picked up all this charge with regard right. to, you know, certainly the events of this year have exploded things, but there's, you know, during the time you were working on it, you're obviously aware of like, sure, sure. I mean, it's a cliche, you know, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Well, guess what? <laughs> we've circled right back around to 1970, which was one of the worst years we've ever had and apparently learned nothing in the 50 years since. And we are, I mean, it could be, it could wind up being worse, but it's certainly, I think, going to be as bad as 1970. Um, Brina, with regard to your work and your visual strategies, what I'm noticing in particular, especially among younger political cartoonists, is, you know, they're shooing the old fashioned single panel, here's some labels of things, you know, like a, a single visual idea in favor of narrative, which is kind of what to degree everyone on this panel is doing here and there. Uh, please talk about your, your visual approach with this and, and why narrative in particular uh, is so useful for you in uh, talking about your uh, personal political issues and how you're resisting oppressive structures. Yeah, I think it's, funny actually how I became more motivated to draw more comics, um, especially centering more on identity and um, just like how, how race functions based off of my positionality. Um, I first like, um, I guess I got into comics uh, through education. I used to do after school um, um, comic arts, like classes in San Francisco and um, I realized whenever I had to like create some kind of prompt I had to be really quick and create like artwork that's going to be really digestible and I think that's kind of just stuck with me like intuitively like I have to make this pretty digestible and I think about um, also like my current students I teach um, a Latina Latino studies class at San Francisco State and I'm so glad I'm getting away with teaching comics <laughs> in this class because it's more of like a lecture on like a survey of images, but we're, we're purely looking at comics in this case. And a lot of them haven't read comics. Um, they might've like seen, um, like, I guess like 
the closest thing that they have access to or what's within their proximity is like watching cartoons. They might have seen a comic strip of like peanuts a long, long, long time ago. I actually feel my age when I use peanuts references in my <laughs> slideshows. They're like they don't know like any of the characters' names besides Snoopy or Charlie Brown. Like, oh my God, I'm such an old guy, but um you think about how not on this panel you're not <laughs> big guy <laughs> <Big people. laughs> yeah um i think about how am i going to disseminate information that's going to be easy for folks to understand um for various ages um since the age range is also really diverse as well um in these classes so for me like condensing things also just kind of makes it easier for me to for myself as like a millennial person to like absorb and understand things and because i'm also in a really interesting time where i have to teach via zoom we can't do like what like two hour lectures like from beginning to end i think what's also challenging us especially in the age of like information we have to figure out ways that are going to make the artwork um i don't want to say attractive but um i guess engaging like you want to like be inspired or you want to stick with the story so a lot of um um my cartooning style i feel like happens to be really um inspired by like anime manga even though those are long form like forms of storytelling um but I also think about how, um, this is gonna be such a silly reference, like how like Hello Kitty also inspires me, like just making something, I don't wanna say just like adorable or cute, but just something, um, I guess inviting. That's my cartooning style has been kind of called that before. Um, but yeah, I think it stems from, again, being an educator, working with youngsters and trying to figure out how can I make comics as a medium, like understandable for them as much as it would be for somebody else who's older who has never read a comic before. Do you, does your approach change when you do work for the NIB? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I feel like um, I get to still recycle some of these techniques that I used from teaching, but um, I, I get to just, I guess, pour, um, put a little bit more of my personal style. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think how, how distinct that is versus things I've used in the classroom. But I guess um, it's kind of grown where I feel like I, I kind of come to my own sort of adult cartooning style. I don't know if that makes any sense. Sure. Yeah. Every but, cartoonist evolves. <laughs> you know, as, as Durf said, he completely changed his style. Well, not every cartoonist evolves. No, that's not, you can't really say that. <laughs> many cartoonists, especially good yes, ones. Many evolve. cartoonists evolved. But... <laughs> One, one's worth paying attention to, usually. Mm. Um, Definitely. Sometimes I think I'm devolving. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because you hit on, um, when you, when you reference Hello Kitty, that wasn't an all absurd reference because the striking thing about that particular line is the simplicity and iconic nature of the image where it's like, um, it's like looking at Ernie Bushmiller's old Nancy strip and what someone once you know, wrote. It's, it's easier to read it than to not read it once you've seen it. It's like you've got to, your eye is drawn to it and you have to go all the way through and um, the same is true with Hello Kitty. It's like it draws your eye and makes you look at it because of the way it's structured. And I feel that that's definitely true of, of, of your art is that um, it, it, you're drawn in initially because of the visuals and you're carried along in um, with the narrative. Um, now, now, Bob, you're a completely anomalous case because um, for as long as I've, followed your career, your entire career has been based on um, finding ways to repurpose and mimic other people's art styles 
to create um, sort of a new, you know, you're the, you're the original, um, you're the original mashup guy. Um, before that was even concept and music, you were doing things with art and mixing uh, comics art slash, you know, low art with literature. Um, what kind of drew you into a different direction career-wise in terms of the kind of things you've written about? Because you're not really doing so much about um, literature anymore and your work has become more distinctly political, not just with it, with Constitution Illustrated and the Trump book, but even terms and conditions, I thought was um, a, a sneakily political work as well in writing about, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, it was the- um, It's the Apple iTunes, iTunes agreement. The iTunes agreement and sort of like, um, forcing people to read something that they would never want to read, but it was <laughs> legally binding. Well, it's funny that twice in, in, in talking about my work, you've said that I've written of these things and I famously have not written any of them. True. I've illustrated them. Um, the iTunes agreement is the literal text of the terms and conditions as it existed when I made the book in 2016. They've of course, co of course updated it. And the constitution is of course the complete text of the, of the, of the document as it exists. I feel like that there's a continuation from what I was doing earlier, but I do think there is a kind of evolution, as you were saying earlier, hopefully I'm one of those cartoonists who's evolved in a certain way. But I think that um, my impulse is still to sort of take the culture around us and, and kind of re-contextualize it, reinvent it, make people look at it differently. I really appreciated what Brina was saying before about making work that was, I forget if you said appealing or accessible, but I think those are terms that I think about a lot and I think are very important. Um, I, I've, I've tried really hard in all my work to sort of let people find a way in because comics can be daunting for people who haven't read them before. So I try to choose styles that people are familiar with um, as a way to make them look at what I'm delivering. And what I'm delivering is, is texts or, or stories for, that other people have, have invented and have lasted through time, even if it's only for 10 years like the iTunes agreement. But um, you know, I, I, I try to work uh, with those texts. So I think there's a continuum that way with what I was doing before. But um, I think partially the way comics has evolved has made me sort of think more in terms of long form comics. Uh, which is not something I was doing before. And also, obviously, the situation in the world right now um, made me move more toward um, the political realm. I, I don't know what I'll do next. Um, I, I, you know, I pray I won't have to do anything drastic, <laughs> depending what happens next year. I mean, I can't imagine things are going to get better, but they might get better. So... You know, time Hopefully will tell. Being Apocalypse Illustrated from R. Sikoriak. There you go. That's perfect. The last burning vestiges of the, of the world. Yes, I. Hopefully, we won't see that. Uh, so, uh, Fish, I'm interested in your uh, your visual style. Um, I noticed there seems uh, for a lot of stuff you it seems very brush heavy. Um, very very detailed, and I'm interested in. Uh, when you have when you have your different projects, um, what visual approach do you like to use uh, in order to carry it out? Well, it, it always depends on the subject um, and the the hyper realism stuff that that you're referring to is uh, it's just a technique to either demonstrate the seriousness seriousness with which I'm trying to engage in the subject. Um, like if there's, if there's some reason to show, uh, something grotesque, um, I will take the six, seven, eight hours, depending to really make it visually grotesque. Uh, there's in fact, there's a, there's a drawing that I did two days ago, uh, that is called, um, America's Angriest Inch. Now it's a you you may have to burn your email if you if somebody sends it to you. It is it's so grotesque. It took me two days to draw, um, and it's there's nothing very intelligent about it. 
I won't tell you what it is, but it involves Trump. Oh, geez, I can guess. <laughs> you sick bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been going crazy over the last 48 hours. It's like easily the, the most popular thing I've done this year. Um, and so again, what I like to use that sort of craft because people don't expect fine art to be used in that way. So while they're sort of being wowed by the craft of the of the artwork, it allows me to be in front of it longer than if it were just a simple line drawing. Um, that said, and to Brina's point, when you have something that is a simple line drawing, which I also do, um, I save those for uh, jokes um, and for kindness, <laughs> or just like the brevity of 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 a point. You know, I don't want to belabor sort of the viewing experience if I can, if I, if I can at all help it. So it always depends on exactly with uh, with what I the subject that I'm that I'm drawing. That's what I like most about your work is how you flip back and forth between styles, and they're all great. Well, and it's just such a, a visual potpourri, you know. Well, when I started, it was really funny because it was. I remember there were some people who said that they knew how this business worked. And they told me, they said, listen, you're never gonna make it anywhere unless you just figure out what your style is. And <laughs> it made no sense to me. I thought you'll never was... work, you'll never draw Garfield, kid. Yeah, right, right. I ignored that advice too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all did, I think. That's <laughs> <laughs> very good, yeah. Kind of across the board. Yep. Well, that's actually a very interesting thing is that, uh, all of you have done different kinds of work in your career. You've had different audiences, um, Brina teaching. Um, Bob, I know you've done some um, uh, some editing or, or some um, uh, mentor work with comic schools as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but it, it, it's interesting that each of you has kind of like taken this different path of well, I need to find a different way of expressing myself because this is a different subject rather than one size fits all. Uh, why, do you, why do you think you evolved that way as cartoonists as opposed to other people who really did take that one style and just stick with it? I would argue that the, that the, the profession has, has been so decimated. It's not even, I don't even think it's a choice anymore. Yeah, I don't, I think it's sink or swim. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if anybody knows the Herb Block Foundation did a study and they determined that at the turn of the 20th century, there were around 2000 political slash editorial cartoonists working for newspapers. And that was the job. And this is when, you know, it was the father usually who had the job. The wife didn't work. This was a real job that put people through colleges and paid for houses. Uh, the, the study concludes, I think, in 2012, where it was determined that there were fewer than 40 of those those positions left in the United States, there's fewer st there's fewer now, and it's not because it's not an effective form of communication. There's another reason for it, and yeah, it was it was killed. It was, it was forced actually, extinction by the political or by the corporate suits that owned that bought up all these papers. Right. They killed the genre. Yeah, and also to get to the point too is if you want to look at it as just the how artists communicate with these issues. The arts community itself was also killed by the elimination of the middle class. It's very hard to just exist as an artist anymore, where at one time you were able just to have a bad, crappy job and then, you know, live in squalor, but you could still at least live and you could produce a lot more in the hours that you dedicated to your artwork. There's penalties and, there's, and it's not feasible anymore. So it's not very inviting to lots of people. Yeah, and uh, that certainly makes a degree of sense because when you see these uh, new newspapers being bought up by hedge funds, uh, the first people they fire tend to be the political cartoonists if they still exist. And the irony is that 100 years ago, the comics page and the political cartoonists were the reason people bought newspapers. Right. Less than a hundred years ago, I mean, the free weeklies were built on the backs of cartoonists. That's right. the only reason people picked up those rags in the first place right. was to read Chris Ware and Matt Groening and Linda Berry. Sure. 
So that's recent past, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, and it's interesting because those kinds of cartoons, whether they were left or right, were a form of resistance. And it seemed that whoever, the people who were buying them weren't interested in that, even if they were, these were actual assets that people wanted to buy. Um, a hedge fund isn't interested in resistance? God, who would have figured? <laughs> exactly. Well, um, a mistake, though, too. I would, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important point to make that if we're going to be talking about what was happening to the alt-weeklies, and we even go back a, a couple steps uh, further back in time and just look at the Comics Underground movement, remember that at one time, it was not, the debate wasn't about, you know, which side of the aisle you were on. It was, it was criticizing the so-called winners in the society and how the losers were, were suffering at the hands of the elite. So the debate wasn't so much Democrat versus Republican. It was about the people who were being brutal and the people who were suffering as a result of the brutality. And I think that, that again, I, I, I think that that's a smarter way to engage with, with, with so-called politics now, because I think that that is the most truthful way to, to, um, to, to alter our course. Um, as we sort of wind down the panel, I'd like to ask, what do you see your, for yourself is your responsibility as a cartoonist in speaking what you see as, you know, truth to power to talk about um, the way people are oppressed? And how do you see yourself continuing to do that as you further in your career? And we can start with Durf and go around. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it better be good. Uh, yeah, man, I'm drawing a blank. Um, you know, I, I'm, I don't know that I'm thinking that way anymore, you know, honestly. Um, I'm not on a crusade. I mean, I, I think if I do good provocative work, no matter what it is, that good things will happen. And good things will happen for, you know, the people. Uh, my readers will enjoy it and, you know, good things will happen to me. But, I, you know, as far as, you know, charging the ramparts um no i'm not i'm not uh i don't think that's my role anymore um i'll leave that to people like fish <laughs> <laughs> brina how about you yeah i feel like the the point that was made earlier about um about versatility and different cartooning styles like as much as um I feel like a deep like social like responsibility to um, all of these various communities that intersect with like my identity. Like I think that's going to, those narratives are still going to be a part of what I make for as long as I'm able to. But, um, but I also um, believe in like self care in the form of cartooning and just also doing it purely like for self-indulgence. Um, like um, Duane was mentioning how you um, reserve like a certain cartoon style just for the jokes. And sometimes when I'm not wanting to like make a, a comic like, specific about identity, it's just gonna be about some sort of like self-deprecating thing that I'm going through right now. Because I also believe that, you know, this is another reason why I, we're we're in this because this is like the best way we can communicate um, all of these motions that we're going through. Bob, as much as um, uh, this is a really interesting um, question, and, and I'm just thinking about it. As much as um, I love funny comics, I feel like the work that I make, um, I always try to approach it with. A certain honesty and, and 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 serious intent, and I mean, I think I hope a lot of my comics have humor in them or, or are humorous, but I also feel like my role is to relay the 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 content that I'm trying to illustrate or or disseminate in a in a way that is um, thorough and thoughtful, and <laughs> this I mean I I love dumb gag cartoons, <laughs> but, um, and I, I don't really feel like a political car cartoonist per se, but I think that 
I've always approached the form of cartooning very sincerely. And um, I think that that, maybe that sincerity, even though, again, I'm hiding behind these, these other styles and I'm hiding behind these masks, there's a certain sincerity that I think comes through in my work, or I hope comes through in my work. So I hope that that humanity that can come through, even again, through this, like these disguises and this parodic surface, I hope that that is a form of, of uh, positive action in the world. I would agree. I mean, I think that, I think that all of us have mentioned some version of attempting to be honest and being sincere. Um, uh, and I would add to that, what I try to do is I am absolutely free and willing to be sloppy and wrong and impulsive, um, all of these things. Because I think that I, I really want to communicate the, the full three-dimensionality of the human experience whenever I can. <laughs> so, you know, I follow my mood and I follow, I, I sort of lead with my heart. Um, so if I'm feeling joyful and snarky and hence hopeful, um, I'll communicate that, but in a half hour after that, I'll be ready to say that we are absolutely doomed and we have like just months left and I'll communicate that. Because I think everybody de deserves the, the opportunity to uh, change their mind constantly, because we do, because our moods change throughout the day. So I, my job is to communicate all the, as if I'm talking to my friends, because to me, that's the, that's the meaning of life. I like to hang out and I like to, say appropriate things, but also inappropriate things and, you know, and, and see what happens after that. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, and thanks for sharing um, what goes into your work. And uh, I also like what Brina said at the end about um, sometimes I draw this because it's self care and um, it's clear that for all of you, um, you haven't lost the fact that Drawing makes you feel good. It is a pleasurable activity and it's not just your vocation. It's a thing that's always helped you cope. And um, you're performing a service in expressing this and showing this to others and allowing them to, you know, kind of enjoy what you're doing. So thank you all very much for participating and thank you all for watching this panel. And, yeah, thanks. Uh, Thank you. More uh, SPX program. Thanks.